Section 21. Astounding Stories of Super Science, Number 7, July 1930. Murder Madness by Murray Leinster. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tommy Howell. Murder Madness by Murray Leinster. Chapter 13 That night, Bell turned burglar. To attempt a rescue of Paula was simply out of the question. He was entirely aware that he would be expected to do just such a thing, and that it would be adequately guarded against. Therefore he prepared for a much more desperate enterprise, by burglarizing a bookstore in the particularly neat method in which members of the trade are instructed. The method was invented by a member of the trade, who was an ex-cabinet maker, and who perished disreputably. He killed a certain courier of a certain foreign government, thereby preventing a minor war and irritating two governments excessively, and was hanged. The method, of course, is simplicity itself. One removes the small nails which hold the molding of a door panel in place. The molding comes out. So does the panel. One enters through the panel, commits one's burglary, and comes out, replacing the molding and the nails with reasonable care. Depending upon the care with which the replacing is done, the means of interest is more or less undiscoverable, but it is usually used when it is not intended that the burglary ever be discussed. Bell abstracted two books, wrapping paper and twine. He departed using great care. He walked three miles out of town and to the banks of the Paraguay. There he carefully saturated the pages of both books in water, carefully keeping the bindings from being wetted. Then he tore one book to pieces, saving the leaves and inserting them between the leaves of the other book. Then, with a Brazil nut candle for illumination, he began to write. You see, when two thoroughly wetted pieces of paper are placed one above the other with a hard surface, such as the cover of another book under them, you can write upon the top one with a stick. The writing will show dark against the gray of the saturated paper. You then remove the top sheet and end, the writing reproduced on the bottom sheet. And then you can dry the second sheet and find the marking vanished, until it is wetted again. It is, in fact, a method of watermarking paper, and it is the simplest of all methods of invisible writing. Bell wrote grimly for hours. The book he had chosen was an old one, an ancient copy of one of Lope de Vega's plays, and the pages were wrinkled and yellow from age alone. When by dawn the last page was dried out, there was no sign that anything other than antiquity had affected the paper and Bell wrapped it carefully and addressed it to an elderly senora of literary tastes in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and enclosed an affectionate letter to his very dear aunt, and signed it with an entirely improbable name. It was mailed before sunrise, the necessary stamps having been filched from the burglarized bookstore, and the price thereof being carefully inserted in the till. Bell had made a complete and painstaking report of every fact he had himself come upon in the matter of the master and his slaves, and appended it to a copy of the report of the dead secret service operative number 114. And he destroyed that after copying it. He had concluded that since he had been given dismissal by Jameson in Rio, he considered himself at liberty to take whatever steps he saw fit and since the Signorina Pala Canalejas had been kidnapped by agents of the master, he intended to take steps which might possibly bring about her safety, but would almost certainly cause his death. The report should be at least of assistance if the trade set to work to combat the master. Bell had no information whatever about that still mysterious and still more horrible person himself. But what he knew about the master's agents he sent to a lady in Puerto Rico who has an astonishingly large number of far-ranging nephews. And then Bell got himself adequately shaved, bought a hearty breakfast, and after one or two heartening drinks was driven grandly to the residence of the Signor Francia, deputy of the master, 
for the Republic of Paraguay. The servants who admitted him gazed blankly when he gave his name. A door was hastily closed behind him. He was ushered into an elaborate reception room, and after an agitated pause, no less than six separate frock-coated persons appeared and pointed large revolvers at him while a seventh searched him exhaustively. Bell submitted amusedly. And now, he said dryly, I suppose the Signor Francia will receive me. There was more agitation. The six men remained, with their weapons pointed at him. The seventh departed, and Bell redressed himself in a leisurely fashion. Ten minutes later, a slender, dark-skinned man with impeccably waxed mustaches entered, regarded Bell with an entirely impersonal interest, took one of the revolvers from one of the six frock-coated gentlemen, and seated himself comfortably. He waved his hand, and they filed uneasily from the room. So far, not one word had been spoken. Bell retrieved his cigarette case and lighted up with every appearance of ease. "'I've come,' he said, "'to request that I be sent to the master. "'I believe that he is anxious to meet me.' "'The dark eyes scrutinized him coldly. "'Then Francia smiled. "'Pero si,' sí, he said negligently, "'he is very anxious to see you. "'I suppose you know what fate awaits you.' "'His smile was amiable and apparently quite friendly, "'but Bell shrugged. "'I suppose,' he said dryly, "'he wants to converse with me.' I have been his most successful opponent to date, I think. Francia smiled again. It was curious how his smile, which at first seemed so genuine and so friendly, became unspeakably unpleasant on its repetition. Yes, Francia seemed to debate some matter of no great importance. You have been very annoying, Signor Bell. The Signor Ribiera asked that you be sent to him. It was his intention to execute you privately. He described a rather amusing method to me, and I must confess that you have annoyed me likewise. Since the Cuyaba plantation was destroyed, my subjects have been much upset. They have been frightened and even stubborn. Only last week, he smiled pleasantly, and the effect was horrible. Only last week, I desired the society of a lady who is my subject, and her husband considered that... Since the fazenda was destroyed, the master would be powerless to extend his grace before long at any event. So he shot his wife and himself. It annoyed me, enough to make me feel that it would be a pleasure to kill you. He raised the revolver meditatively. Well, said Bell coldly. Francia lowered the weapon and laughed. Oh, I shall not do it. I think the master would be displeased. You seem to have the type of courage he most desires in his deputies. And it may yet be that I shall greet you as my fellow deputy, or perhaps my fellow viceroy. So I shall send you to him. I would say that you have about an even chance of dying very unpleasantly, or of being a deputy. Therefore I offer you such courtesies as I may. Bell puffed a cloud of smoke toward the ceiling. I'm about out of cigarettes, he said mildly. They shall be supplied, and uh, if you would desire feminine society, I will have some of my pretty subjects. No, said Bell bluntly. I would like to speak to the Signorina Canalejas, though. Francia chuckled. She left for Buenos Aires last night. The Signor Ribiera sent a most impatient message for her to be sent on at once. I regretted it, but he had the master's authority. I thought her charming myself. The skin about Bell's knuckles was white. His hands had clenched savagely. In that event, he said coldly, the only other courtesy I would ask is that of following her as soon as possible. Francia rose languidly. The revolver dangled by his side, but his grip upon it was firm. He smiled at Bell with the same effect of a horrible, ghastly geniality. "'Within the hour, Signor,' he said urbanely, "'with the guard I shall place over you, it is no harm, I am sure, to observe that the master is at his retreat in Puente Arenas. You will go there tomorrow, as I go to-night.' He moved toward the door and smiled again, and added pleasantly, 
The Signorina was delivered to the Senor Ribiera this morning. Matters moved swiftly after that. A servant brought cigarettes and a tray of liquors, which Bell did not touch. There was the sound of movement, the scurrying, furtive haste, which seems always to imply a desperate sort of fear. Bell waited in a desperate calmness while rage hammered at his temples. Then the clattering of horses' hooves outside. A carriage was being brought. Soldiers came in, and a man beckoned curtly. Bell stuffed his pockets with smokes and followed languidly. He was realizing that there was little pretense of secrecy about the power of the master's deputy here, police and soldiers, but Paraguay, of all of the nations of the southern continent, has learned a certain calm realism about governmental matters. The man who has power is obeyed. The man who has not power is not obeyed. Titles are of little importance, though it is the custom for the man with the actual power eventually to assume the official rank of authority, since the president in Asuncion was no more than a figurehead who called anxiously upon the Signor Francia every morning for instructions concerning the management of the nation. Francia indifferently ignored him whenever he chose and gave orders directly. There would be very little surprise and no disorder whatever when the master proclaimed Paraguay a vice-royalty of his intended empire. The carriage went smartly through the cobbled streets with a cavalry escort all about it. An officer sat opposite Bell with his hand on his revolver. "'I'm receiving at least the honors of royalty,' Bell commented coldly to him in Spanish. Senor, said the officer harshly, "'this is the state in which the deputies of the master were escorted.' He watched Bell heavily, but with the desperate intentness of a man who knows no excuses will be received if his prisoner escapes. Out of the town to a flying field where a multi-engined plane was warming up. It was one of the ships that had been at the master's fazenda of Cuyaba, one of the ships that had fled from the burning plantation. Bell was ushered into it with a ceremonious suspicion. Almost immediately he was handcuffed to his seat. Two men took their place behind him. The big ship rolled forward, lifted, steadied, and after a single circling, set out to the southeast for Buenos Aires. The whole performance had been run off with the smoothly oiled precision of an iron discipline exercised upon men in the grip of deadly fear. One man, at least, reflected Bell grimly, has some qualities that fit him for his job. And then, for hour after hour, the big ship went steadily southeast. It flew over Paraguayan territory for two hours, soaring high over the Lago Ipoya, and on over the swampy country that extends to the Argentine border. It ignored that border and all customs formalities. It went on, through long hours of flight, while mountains rose before it. It rose over those mountains and passed over the first railroad line the first real sign of civilization since leaving Asuncion, at Mercedes, and reached the Uruguay River, where the, where the Meringe joins it. It went roaring on down above the valley of the Rio Uruguay for long and tedious hours more. At about noon, lunch was produced. The two men who guarded Bell ate. Then, with drawn revolvers, they unlocked his handcuffs and offered him food. he ate, of exactly those foods he had seen them eat. He submitted indifferently to the reapplication of his fetters. He had reached a state which was curiously emotionless. If Paula had been turned over to Ribiera that morning, Paula was dead. And just as there is a state of grief which stuns the mind past the realization of its loss, so there is a condition of hatred which leads to an enormous calmness and an unnatural absence of any tremor. Bell had reached that state. The instinct of self-preservation had gone lax. Where a man normally thinks first, if unconsciously, of the protection of his body from injury or pain, Bell had come to think first, and with the same terrible clarity, of the accomplishment of revenge. He would accept the master's terms if the master offered him. He would become the master's subject, accepting the poison of madness without a qualm. He would act and speak and think as a subject of the master until his opportunity came, and then. 
His absolute calmness would have deceived most men. It may have deceived his guards. Time passed. The Rio de la Plata spread out widely below the roaring multi-engined plain, and the vast expanse of buildings which is Buenos Aires appeared far ahead in the gathering dust. Little twinkling lights blinked into being upon the water and the earth far away. Then one of the two guards touched Bell on the shoulder. Senor, he said sharply above the motor's muffled roar, we shall land. A car will draw up beside the plane. There will be no customs inspection. That has been arranged for. You can have no hope of escape. I ask if you will go quietly into the car. Why not? asked Bell evenly. I went to Signor Francia of my own accord. The guard leaned back. The city of Buenos Aires spread out below them. The tumbled, congested old business quarter glittered in all its offices, and the broad Avenida de Mayo cut its way as a straight slash of glittering light through the section of the city to eastward. By contrast, from above, the far-flung suburbs seemed dark and somber. The big plain roared above the city, settling slowly, banked steeply, and circled upon its farther side, and dipped down toward what seemed an absurdly small area which sprang into a pinkish glow on their descent. That area spread out as the descent continued, though, and was a wide and level field when the ship flattened out and checked and lumbered to a stop. A glistening black car came swiftly, humming into place alongside, almost before the clumsy aircraft ceased to roll. Its door opened. The two men got out and waited. The hangars were quite two hundred yards away, and Bell saw the glitter of weapons held inconspicuously but quite ready. He stepped out of the cabin of the plane with a revolver muzzle pressing into his spine. Other revolver muzzles pressed sharply into his sides as he reached earth. Smiling faintly, he took four steps, clambered up into the glistening black car, and settled down comfortably into the seat. The two men who had waited by the car followed him. The door closed, and Bell was in a padded silence that was acutely uncomfortable for a moment. A dome light glowed brightly, however, and he lighted nearly the last of the cigarettes from Ascension, with every appearance of composure as the car started off with a lurch. The windows were blank. Thick upholstered padding covered the spaces where openings should have been, and there was only the muffled vibration of the motor and the occasional curiously distinct noise of a flexing spring. "'Just a matter of curiosity,' said Bell mildly. What is the excuse given on the flying field for this performance? Or is the entire staff subject to the master? Two revolvers were bearing steadily upon him, and the two men watched him with the unwavering attention of men whose lives depend upon their vigilance. You, senor, said one of them, without expression or a smile, are the corpse of a prominent politician who died yesterday at his country home. And then, for half an hour or more, the car drove swiftly and stopped, and drove swiftly forward again as if in traffic. Then there were many turns, and then a slow and cautious traverse of a relatively few feet. It stopped, and then the engine vibration ceased. "'I advise you, senor,' said the same man who had spoken before, and in the same emotionless voice, "'not to have hope of escape in the moment of alighting.' We are in an enclosed court, and there are two gates locked behind us. Bell shrugged, as there was the clatter of a lock operating. The door swung wide. He stepped down into a courtyard surrounded by nearly bare walls. It had once been the patio of a private home of some charm. Now, however, it was bleak and empty. A few discouraged flowers grew weedily in one corner. The glow of light in the sky overhead assured Bell that he was in the very heart of Buenos Aires, but only the most subdued of rumbles spoke of the activity and the traffic of the city going on without. "'This way,' said the man with the expressionless voice. The other man followed. The chauffeur of the car stood aside as if some formality required him neither to start the motor or return to his seat until Bell was clear of the courtyard." through a heavy timber door, along a passageway with the odor of neglect, upstairs which once had been impressive and ornamental, 
into a room without windows. You will have an interview with the Senorita Canalejas in five minutes, said the emotionless voice. The door closed, while Bell found every separate muscle in his body draw taut, and while his brain at first was dazed with incredulous relief, then it went dark with a new and ghastly terror. They know Yahweh, he heard himself saying coldly, which makes any person obey any command. They may know other and more hellish ones yet. He fought for self-control, which meant the ability to conceal absolutely any form of shock that might await him. That one was in store, he was certain. He paced grimly the length of the room and back again. Something on the carpet caught his eye. It was a bit of string. He stared at it incredulously. The end was tied into a curious and an individual knot, which looked like it might be the pastime of a sailor, and which looked like it ought to be fairly easy to tie. But it was one of those knots which wandering men sometimes tie absent-mindedly in the presence of stirring events. It was the recognition knot of the trade, one of those signs by which men may know each other in strange and peculiar situations. And there were many other knots tied along the trailing length of the string, it seemed as if some nervous and distraught prisoner in this room might have toyed abstractedly with a bit of cord. Only, Bell drew it through his fingers, double knot, single knot, double knot. They spelled out letters in the entirely simple Morse code of the telegrapher, if one noticed. R, B, R, A, G, N, O, N, P, L, A, H, R, E, S, T, T, G, T, J. Your old-time telegrapher uses many abbreviations. Your shortwave fan uses more. Mostly they were made by a simple omission of vowels in normal English. In normal English words, when the recognition sign at the beginning was considered, the apparently cryptic letters leaped into meaning. Ribiera gone on. Paula here sit tight. Jameson. When the door opened again, and a terribly pale Paula was ushered in. Bell gave no sign of surprise. He simply took her in his arms and kissed her, holding her very, very close. End of chapter 13 End of section 21